Temperature effects on water and fish is a huge subject, more complex than most people probably realize. For our purposes in this video, we're going to hit the practical highlights that affect our fishing. In nearly all our video fishing journals, you'll see me considering water temperatures. And this video will provide the basic whys behind those considerations. For winter temperature discussions, uh, a unique set of circumstances over the majority of the bass's range, I'm going to refer you to our winter video fishing journals, uh, particularly uh, journals 10, 11, and 12. Here's how I'm going to break this subject down. How temperature affects fish and our fishing, uh, both seasonally and short term, that is on a day-to-day -day and even hour-to-hour -hour basis. How water heats and cools and then how to make best use of a thermometer. Biologists have come to call temperature the master factor because a cold-blooded creature's basic metabolic and physiological performance capabilities are largely governed by the heat available in the water they're sitting in. Fish need adequate heat to go about their business to successfully feed, evade predators, and to reproduce. And this, of course, affects our fishing. What passes for adequate heat, though, varies, uh, both seasonally and even daily. The seasonal ecological changes that fish experience are essentially defined by water temperatures. And water temperatures can influence the daily activity patterns of fish as well. At either time scale, what we're considering here essentially is how much energy a fish is able and or willing to expend to meet its needs. A number of variables are at work here, but temperature is an underlying one. While overall performance levels peak in warm water and bottom out in cold water, fish are able to acclimate, that is, adjust their metabolism to match seasonal water temperature changes and remain functional throughout the year. Some research suggests that it takes a fish inside of 24 hours to acclimate uh, and become basically functional uh, to a fairly rapid uh, water temperature change. The process continues, however, taking a longer period to fully acclimate, uh, what's called acclimatize, uh, that is, acclimation at a seasonal time scale. While fish species can acclimate to a range of temperatures, there are some temperatures, uh, fairly specific numbers actually, that weigh in more heavily on them than others. And these become important thresholds that help us define the seasons from uh, that particular species perspective. These numbers can help us anglers uh, make some sense of certain seasonal presentation puzzles, uh, namely the uh, spring and fall feeding binges, the midsummer doldrums or dog days as, as they're called, um, and, and uh, the winter crash. We can't often just walk up to a water body and accurately judge just exactly where in the given season we are um, on a given fishing day, uh, much less the mood the fish are in. But water temperatures can provide us with a pretty good indicator of where we stand. Uh, even on water bodies we haven't seen in a week, a year, or ever for that matter. I use water temperatures to help delineate the seasons and to some extent to get a bead on the expected mood of the fish in front of me. Now, fishing via thermometer is certainly not about following fixed values. Uh, things are a bit more complicated out there. Uh, but there are known roughly fixed temperature values that limit performance capabilities in fish. Uh, these limitations or, or threshold values are fairly powerful predictors of performance related behaviors like feeding, wintering, and spawning. Uh, migrations are influenced by temperature too, but 
I should mention that there is likely uh, what's called an endogenous internal rhythm at work there too, probably entrained by photoperiod changes. Uh, that may explain why fish may begin to migrate despite unseasonable temperatures. The first well-documented threshold temperature for largemouth bass, the species we're, we've been focusing on, is the 50 degree Fahrenheit or 10 degree centigrade mark, uh, a known threshold below which large mouths uh, from all latitudes apparently show a marked decrease in performance capabilities, uh, their activity and their growth. There's also an upper uh, threshold temperature in the low to mid 80s at which largemouth bass's uh, metabolic engine is running at full steam, offering the potential for peak performance and growth. Above this threshold, performance begins to wane. At around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, bats will die if they remain in such water for very long. Now these threshold temperatures are uh, not specific to bats. Uh, all species have them. Uh, for another example, uh, for brown trout, these threshold values fall out at the uh, uh, roughly 45 degree Fahrenheit downturn, uh, a peak at 62 Fahrenheit, and lethal temperatures uh, at 85 Fahrenheit or thereabouts. Interestingly, when streams hit 60 plus degrees Fahrenheit, browns commonly shift to nocturnal hunting activity, uh, much like bass are apt to do at the 80 degree Fahrenheit mark. So you may be asking, why can bass be caught during daylight in 90 degree Fahrenheit water? As I'd said, there are other variables at play. So let's continue. Some times of year uh, offer better fishing, uh, often more aggressive fish, than others. And this in itself can cure a lot of angling ills. Some anglers only fish during these periods, as falling success rates can weed out casual anglers. Uh, bass are still catchable other times of year, but the duration or timing of their activity periods and their accessibility to many, uh, especially casual anglers, eventually take their toll. Bass appear to show a general seasonal rhythm of activity that shows up in how aggressive or receptive they are toward, toward fishing lures, uh, especially horizontally retrieved ones, uh, you know, chuck and wine kind of fishing. The seasons with the most aggressive activity when bass are often easiest to catch generally occur in the early spring, in the early summer, and then again in the fall. Uh, I've come to call these seasonal periods th uh, the feeding binge periods. Conversely, the seasons with the seemingly most apparent periods of inactivity, um, at least toward our lures, are the midwinter and midsummer, when water temperatures are at the bass's physiologic extremes. Now, you might be asking, <laughs> and should ask, isn't summer when bass are most active and feed the most? Relative to other seasons, bass do show the most activity and to be able to digest more food during summer when their metabolic rate is high, when it peaks. However, and this is critical to understand, over many parts of the bass's range, midsummer may bring temperatures to and above the bass's metabolic efficiency threshold, uh, that low to mid 80s Fahrenheit number that we uh, had, had just introduced. While being metabolically stoked may allow bass to digest more food per unit time, running an engine at full throttle requires an awful lot of fuel, or more accurately, running that engine at a high idle. Using the throttle is a decision a given fish must make. So in the real world, if bass don't capture enough food, they will lose body weight at such an, a high engine idling rate. Uh, thus, midsummer bass may reduce activity, uh, uh, back off on the throttle that is, to conserve energy and begin to choose hunting times, uh, off times, more limited periods as well, when feeding success is apt to be highest. This likely explains a good chunk of those summer doldrums in fishing action that so many waters experience. Southern bass may fare a bit better in the heat, largely because southern waters generally produce much more food than northern waters can, allowing southern bass to actually make good use of that high idling engine. Uh, still, the low to mid-80s threshold appears to be shared by all bass, 
um, I even uh, the Florida, uh, Florida uh, species, the uh, Floridana species. The seasonal high aggression, high catchability binge periods appear to be heavily influenced, if not basically controlled, by temperature. These periods see water temperatures between that uh, roughly 50 degree Fahrenheit and 80, uh, low 80s Fahrenheit marks. Uh, when on the upswing or downswing toward a more favorable temperature condition. This general upswing or downswing in water temperatures pretty much nails what the transition seasons, spring and fall, are all about. Evidence that temperature is a major factor in bass catchability shows in the apparent lack of a summer doldrums period in the far northern parts of the bass's range, where water temperatures rarely exceed 80 Fahrenheit. And in my own neck of the woods in the northern U.S. here, unseasonably cold summers in which water temperatures don't break 80 or years when the mid-70s water temperatures hold well into summer, the bass remain aggressive, often shallow, and do not lose body condition. It appears that the bass can simply afford to remain active uh, in midsummer shallows when under moderated temperatures. I've actually come to call the, the mid to upper 70s, uh, right around the 77 degree Fahrenheit mark, if you want to call a number, the largemouth bass's peak jumping temperature, in which largemouths are prone to leaping high upon hookup. And pulling like small malls, oh, you seemingly having enough energy, energy to spare. <laughs> Uh, by the way, brown trout's jumping temperature is right around the 57 degree Fahrenheit mark. The spring binge fires up at or just before the fish hit that 50 degree Fahrenheit mark. The early summer binge comes on when bass have come out of the spawn. Ravenous. Okay, when water temperatures are now in their 70s and rising toward the bass's peak metabolic activity and growth temperature. This period is also when some key prey species begin spawning too, uh, uh, shad and sunfish species, resulting in a perfect storm. Also through the spawn and for weeks following, male bass are driven by hormones that drive aggression, even though they are feeding little during this period. Finally, fall binge coincides with bass maximizing fat deposits for uh, both overwinter survival and to begin their uh, seasonal reproductive tissue development. Okay, <laughs> so those are great times of year to be fishing, but bass feed all year round. So over the course of the year, we find as anglers, we must adjust to catch them. Uh, locations, timing, and presentation. In terms of presentation, allures forward or horizontal speed can be particularly telling. Over the years, I've come to recognize some general ballpark water temperatures associated with bass's apparent capability or, or general willingness to chase down moving, especially horizontally moving lures. Water temperatures under 45 degrees Fahrenheit most often require very slow forward retrieve speeds and or long pauses between forward motion to uh, elicit commi committed bites. Uh, those fish have to know they can catch that lure. At roughly 50 degrees Fahrenheit, our options increase, the fish being much more willing to, or at least capable of, meeting us part of the way. At or above 55 degrees Fahrenheit, we can start picking up the pace, and topwaters become a really good possibility. Above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, bass can really chase, and above 60, you cannot reel too fast if a bass really wants that bait. Uh, not that that's the best tact, but if the fish are willing, you can sure cover a lot of water and catch a lot of bass. Between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit seems to be the optimum temperature range for bass aggressiveness and stamina uh, when they appear to have energy to spare. Above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, bass's metabolic engines are beginning to peak, which can result in inconsistent effects on the bass's willingness to chase lures. Again, 
These are ballpark numbers because there are many variables at play that weigh in on a fish decision to activate or, or lay low. Uh, factors that can trump temperature. Uh, and I won't leave you high and dry here. When we fish, we do not operate on a seasonal time scale, uh, but on a daily, hourly, even momentary one. So how much influence on fish activity uh, is, is there short term? Good question. <laughs> one I've been asking and prying into for a long time now. Trouble is, as timing gets tight, chaos reigns, okay? Lots of variables. So realize that this is very much a work in progress. Here's what I feel I can offer. I guess the best question to kick this off with would be to address some of that chaos. Why are fish responses to short-term temperature changes apt to be so variable? When a cold front rolls through, was it the temperature that changed our fishing? <laughs> and there are times when it appears the bass don't even appear to notice a water temperature change. The answers in both and many other cases can be summed up. Depends on conditions. Well, I guess that should pretty much wrap it up. <laughs> okay, that was evil. <laughs> Pisses you off, doesn't it? Okay, let's go after some of those competing or, or additive variables uh, that are at work down there. Bass, as a species, are particularly robust in terms of handling temperature change. Uh, coupled with the fact that water is particularly good at buffering temperature changes, we shouldn't be too quick to write bass off with the whim, whim of, a, of most weather events. Angler observations suggest that temperature drops of a good six to eight degrees Fahrenheit is required to really knock bass down uh, uh, prior to the, the acclimation period. Uh, and that is a fairly rare event, uh, taking a serious cold front to produce that kind of, kind of change, uh, especially much beyond the water's water surface. Bass have been documented drastically decreasing feeding during sudden temperature drops. But if bass are onto vulnerable prey, it can take a heck of a change to knock those, those feeding bass off their horses. Problem is, and here's where things get a little sticky, <laughs> most bass aren't right on vulnerable prey most of the time. So a fish's response to temperature changes, positive or negative, is greatly influenced by whether or not there's a payoff in store. Which brings us to the most powerful wild cards in the deck, uh, security in food. Given a choice, Bass have been known to choose access to food uh, or security in the, the form of good cover over temperature. At the extremes, uh, bass have been known to make forays, uh, albeit short ones, into lethal water temperatures in power plant lakes uh, to take advantage of compromised prey. Uh, and they've been known to actively move for cold shocked shad uh, during extreme cold spells during winter, uh, resulting in fish that will chase a horizontally moving lure in extreme cold. Bass are capable of performing in very cold water, uh, although not nearly to the level of warm acclimated ones. Um, I've actually videoed bass beneath the ice on frozen ponds, uh, bolting after prey, uh, albeit in water that's, that's rather syrup-like. <laughs> There just has to be a payoff in store for such an effort. Uh, this is true any time of year, but in certain seasons, windows of time within seasons, and even uh, daily, a bass's strike trigger is more firmly or lightly set. Now, fish are actually capable of registering very fine temperature changes to well less than a single degree Fahrenheit. But how such sensitivity affects a given fish is likely contingent upon the relative importance of other competing cues present at the time. Those other variables that signal fish to activate or not. Increasing temperatures during the colder seasons can spark aggressive activity, uh, something I try to take advantage of, especially during the transition seasons, uh, spring and fall. 
In the spring, I look for heated water, especially when it's stacked up against good prey holding cover. You might want to see Video Fishing Journal 18 as a good example of this. When this sets up well, and, and I, I like a good six degree or better change over the course of the day, uh, I've come to call these areas carnage zones. <laughs> In the midfall, uh, good warming days can bring fish shallow and creative aggressive bite windows too. Uh, uh, great times to be throwing aggressive topwaters like buzzbaits. Now, we can't just walk up to a water body, drop a thermometer in just anywhere, and make an accurate call. Any one reading could easily lead us astray. We need to know a few things first to make sense of those measurements that we get. First, we need to know how water bodies heat and cool, and how that heat gets distributed. Uh, then we need to know where to take readings that will give us the best picture of what's happening in that water. Only then uh, can we make some educated guesses as to what those temperature values uh, might mean for the fish and our fishing. Temperature is a measure of heat held by air, water, or objects. Uh, it comes in and is distributed three ways. By radiation, which is direct sunlight. By convection, which is heat distributed by wind, uh, precipitation, or water inflow. Uh, and by conduction, which is heat distributed by contact with objects such as substrate or another water mass uh, that has uh, a different heat content. Most heating occurs via direct radiation from the sun. And this changes seasonally, of course, as seasonal sun angle changes. The water surface will affect how much sunlight can penetrate the water too. Uh, flat calm water allows the most sunlight and heat to penetrate. A broken surface reflects a certain amount of incoming sunlight back up and away. Convection is the cause of most heat redistribution uh, by either uh, direct current inflows or by wind generated currents, uh, blowing that warm and cool water, mi mixing them. Warmer water is generally less dense than colder water though, so warmer water floats. Wind will literally skate warm water across the lakes or pond surface uh, possibly piling it up onto downwind shorelines. Conduction offers the weakest or slowest heating, uh, mostly due to the heat buffering ability of water. While rocks above the waterline may heat quickly under the sun, that heat doesn't transfer, uh, get conducted, into the surrounding water very well. Water, for its part, gains and gives up heat much more slowly than air does. This effectively buffers temperature changes that the atmosphere just above the water's surface experiences. So water temperatures change less and take longer to change than air temperatures do, only able to change so much before the next day or night brings further heating or cooling. Thus, temperature changes in aquatic environments follow but lag behind air temperature changes. Knowing this, uh, we can actually use air temperatures to provide a pretty good ballpark estimate of shallow water temperatures in our lakes and ponds. Uh, my rule of thumb is to look at the average of the highs and, and low air temperatures over the previous two to three days to get a bead on shallow water temperatures in nearby lakes and ponds, uh, uh, about the three to five foot depth range. Uh, a bit shallower in those low sun angle seasons and, and, and a bit deeper under high sun. Also, such shallows should be uh, protected shallows, meaning areas that aren't likely to get strong winds that can roll up, uh, that is convect, cold water from nearby deeper water. Uh, the same air to water temperature rule of thumb is ballpark true for rivers and streams too, uh, but they're affected by a few more variables, so we'll have to hit those another time. What I've done over the years is to take temperatures in many conditions to learn how water takes on and gives up heat. It's now pretty quick for me to assess heat and what it might mean to the fish and my fishing.
Taking temperatures that mean something, though, takes time out of my fishing. Worthwhile? <laughs> I think so. But so is keeping our lures wet. You'll need to decide where and when to spend your fit precious fishing time. If you decide to take temperatures, the most useful temperatures to take are temperature profiles and surface temperatures in relation to sunlight incidence and wind direction and strength. Temperature profiles help me identify where in the season I am by allowing me to track heat gain and loss in a water body by tracking what I call the water body's or, or section of a water body's core temperature. This is the temperature of the main mass of water out there that's protected, uh, buffered from changes by the, the layer of surface water above it. Heating and cooling comes in from above, from the atmosphere. And water heats and cools slowly, so deeper layers remain more stable, uh, change more slowly. Uh, so surface temperatures are not the best seasonal indicator because surface temperatures change much more drastically than the main mass of water just beneath, the core. Core temperatures are your best seasonal indicator. So how deep is the core? A good rule of thumb is that the upper three to five feet of water should absorb most incoming heat changes a water body will likely receive over a day or night. This of course changes with the seasons uh, as the sun angle rises and lowers in the sky, uh, changing the angle of incidence uh, of sunlight coming in. However, this sun angle change only occurs during the transition seasons, spring and fall. Summer and winter tend to be relatively stable. Uh, then it's weather changes that are the major effector. The biggest variable tends to be wind. As wind can create water currents strong enough to roll core water up to the surface. Uh, strong winds forming seiches can happen any time of the year and can at times cause the most intense temperature changes a water body might experience. This is especially so during the transition seasons when the difference between the surface and core uh, 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 might be greatest. In larger, deeper water bodies, uh, though, that, that maintain really cold cores, seiches can cause intense temperature changes in midsummer. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of how quickly this can occur and the effect uh, uh, that these seiches can have on fish. The first was a gill netting experience uh, that I had doing fisheries work on a deep trout lake. We were targeting lake trout and did so by taking a temperature profile. For lakers, we needed to set our nets deep enough to stay below 50 Fahrenheit. Overnight, though, a strong west wind came ripping in. <laughs> and the next morning, our nets on the west side of the lake held lakers, lake trout, only along the deepest half of that net. The rest, the upper half of that net, was full of brown trout. Brown trout prefer temperatures around the 55 degree Fahrenheit mark. And a fresh, a fresh profile uh, done that morning revealed that the upper half of the net was indeed now in 55 degree Fahrenheit water. Another time, a friend and I were trolling for Great Lakes trout. And every boat out there was having a tough time finding fish. Uh, because of a strong south wind the previous day and night, my friend and I recognized the likelihood of a sage. So we moved right in shallow into what would normally be 70 degree Fahrenheit smallmouth water. And we began to mark fish over the shallow rock piles there, those smallmouth hotels. <laughs> we commented that those should be smallies, but if they are, they're awfully big ones. And they turned out to be brown trout in 55 degree Fahrenheit water. we caught a bunch of big browns um, and then radioed a friend who was running a charter that day with a big skunk in the boat. <laughs> uh, no fish, no pay was how it worked. As we motored uh, back toward the marina, uh, we, we got a call from that charter. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> we owe you one.
Since bass are shallow water fish in most water bodies, especially largemouths, surface temperatures are important too. The surface is where we can expect most heating and cooling compared with the more buffered depths. Shallow fish are much more apt to be affected by weather changes than are fish in deeper, more stable water. This is the main reason why many fish tend to gravitate to deeper waters during the extreme seasons of winter and summer. And I've found this to be generally true on small ponds as well as large lakes. In the wide view, there are two seasons, a heating season and a cooling season, spring and fall. And these are due to the sun's angle in the sky and day length. High sun penetrates the water's surface, low sun reflects off it. Summer and especially winter are generally the most stable seasons in terms of temperature change. While sun angle and day length drive the seasonal march towards summer and winter, on a day-to-day -day basis, weather brings the most rapid surface temperature changes. Uh, winter, at least over most of the bass's range, rarely sees much daily heating due to the density of that massive cold heat resistant core water out there, uh, the sun's low angle in the sky, and the short days. Fish are most apt to be affected positively or negatively by weather changes during the transition seasons and during the midsummer doldrums when uh, temperatures are already potentially stressful. The warmer seasons, spring through fall, usually see heating and cooling dependent on the weather as the changing seasons duke it out. Come fall, cold fronts, uh, snow in the north is what brings on winter conditions for bass. Uh, core water temperatures below 50 Fahrenheit. Come spring, it's those protected shallows with incident sunshine on them that tend to be the first places to heat and have the best reheat potential in the fall as well. Spring rains can rapidly heat surface temperatures too, especially if tributary inflows are involved. Uh, both places, protected shallows and tributaries, can be fish magnets at these times. Through the colder water periods from fall through early summer, I would rather fish a rising temperature than a falling one. Uh, this does not mean that dropping temperatures at these times uh, you know, always bring poor fishing. If you realize, you may be able to follow your fish. Dropping temperatures can make fish location and positioning actually more predictable at times, uh, such as uh, fish that have been actively hunting, say, up on a flat, now dropping and consolidating into nearby holes or channels, or into nearby cover, following a good temperature drop. During a hot water period, say in midsummer, when water temperatures are at or above that peak metabolic threshold that we talked about, cooling periods can be really good. Uh, these can be due to cold fronts or simply due to eroding temperatures overnight. Night fishing and early morning fishing often peaks during midsummer months. Uh, in, in some waters, especially shallow water bodies, these options may be practically the only game in town. In general, fish being cold-blooded creatures, I expect that a rising heat trend or a dropping trend in summer uh, from summer highs will likely have a positive effect on their activity and, and their willingness to move for a lure. But remember, temperature is not the only variable at play uh, in a fish's decisions to activate. The effects weather has on the fish's activity uh, uh, may have less to do with direct temperature changes than it does other important factors often related to weather activity. Once again, this is not a simple story. Uh, we'll address more of these uh, other factors in our next Conditions and Circumstances video. So, in practical summary, uh, uh, on a daily basis, sun angle, wind, and weather events are the things that I keep tabs on as I fish, uh, looking as the fish do for an advantageous set of conditions and circumstances to jump in on. Uh, for an example of, of this process in action, uh, a, a good example, see Video Fishing Journal 18. Okay. Uh, next up is lighting. Uh, hopefully, see you there.